The golden years I envisioned look nothing like this. Surveying the wagon wheel acres dining room, all I see are elderly faces, real elderly. What's most disheartening? I'm among them. At 62, I refuse to feel this ancient. But the real kicker? Sitting at a table for four, surrounded by strangers, while across the room, my wife Pamela sits with her paramour. The entire retirement complex knows, which adds salt to the wound. I meticulously chose Wagon Wheel Acres for its continuous care option and reasonable buy-in. Our combined monthly fees exceed $3,000, promising peace and convenience. Yet, I never foresaw Robert Nelson's arrival. My appetite vanishes as I watch Pamela engage in lively conversation with Robert. Forty years I spent caring for her, and now he reaps the benefits of her companionship in our twilight years. It's been two weeks since Pamela confessed her intimacy with Robert and her intent to continue. That same afternoon, she relocated all her belongings to his studio apartment. Ours may have a bedroom, but it lacks Robert. I've never contested her decisions, never had the stomach for it. What does that say about me? Over the years, acquiescence seemed easier than confrontation. I pushed my lunch aside, feeling a surge of frustration as I retreated to my room. The thought of footing the bill for her stay here, while Robert Nelson enjoyed all the perks nodded me. Despite years of striving to bring joy to my wife's life, my efforts seemed futile. It was as if Robert possessed some secret knowledge I lacked. In the reflection of my bathroom mirror, a business card, a token from one of the more assertive bachelors, caught my eye. Grabbing a cold beer, I sank into my trusty recliner, the lone relic in the room, untouched by time. Downing two swigs, I scrutinized the gleaming card before me. Berkshire escorts, by the hour or by the day. The absurdity struck me. What could a 62-year-old man possibly do with an escort for an entire day? The notion of even extracting value from an hour seemed doubtful. Emptying the bottle of Foster's, I reached for the phone, my mind a whirlwind of uncertainty. I wasn't sure what I intended to say or do. Perhaps I just needed someone to talk to. Berkshire Escorts, this is Richard speaking. I managed to utter those words before my nerves took over, leaving a conspicuous silence hanging in the air. Berkshire Escorts, hello. Are you still there? Yes, hello. I'm here. I replied, my nervousness palpable. Richard here. Do you have a question for me? Richard's voice remained steady, offering a reassuring presence. How did you know? Well, most callers usually do have questions, he chuckled lightly. So, you're not psychic. Would you like to share your name? Peterson. It's Peterson. Is that necessary? Not really, but it does make conversation easier. My friend Kenneth gave me your card. Ah, Mr. Mitchell. Are you also over at Wagon Wheel? Yes. Is that an issue? Not at all. Why would it be? Kenneth mentioned that you've provided him with companions before, and he was satisfied. Well, that's good to hear. I might just have to give him a discount next time. I didn't know how to respond, causing a brief lull in the conversation. Peterson, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. I'm just not sure what to say or ask. Let me assist you. How long do you need company for? Probably an hour or two. Just someone to have dinner with, maybe at a nice restaurant. An hour or two should suffice. That's all you're looking for. I'm not seeking intimacy, if that's what you're implying. Just a pleasant companion for a few hours. It felt awkward, considering Pamela was the only woman I'd ever been with. Peterson, our escorts charge $300 per hour. That's quite a sum just for dinner companionship. Yeah, I understand. When you say young lady, what age range are we talking about? Well, most of our escorts are under 30. That won't work for me. I prefer women over 50. I find younger women a bit too. Well, let's just say I prefer maturity in class. Do you have any suggestions for someone older? Finding women in that age bracket in this industry is a bit challenging. I can search around for you, though. 
Will that change the price? I can't say for sure at this point. I have your number from caller ID. Let me look into it and call you back in about an hour. Is that okay? That works. If possible, could you arrange for tonight around 7? Where were you planning to take her? I was thinking of the Black Angus. Does that sound good? That should be fine, Peterson. Give me an hour. Feeling a bit relieved, I hung up. While Pamela and Robert would be having chicken patty parmesan, I'd be enjoying Philet Mignon. For the next hour, I meticulously went through my wardrobe like a teenager preparing for prom. I settled on a navy blazer, gray turtleneck, and tan chalky pants. I wasn't certain if Richard would come through, but it was worth a shot. I answered the phone after the third ring, deliberately taking my time to avoid appearing too eager. Peterson speaking. Peterson, it's Richard. I have good news. Your escort will be waiting for you outside the Sheridan Hotel at seven. She'll be in a hunter green dress. Does that work for you? That's perfect. I might arrive a bit early, but I'll try not to seem too eager. And ah, how old is she, by the way? Now, Peterson, you know better than to ask a lady her age. But for your peace of mind, your date this evening is 58. I trust she meets your standards of classiness. Any other questions? Just one. How should I settle the payment? In cash. Bring cash. The hours leading up to the evening flew by. Despite it being just dinner, the anticipation filled me with excitement. I craved the romantic ambience. Sure, there were plenty of potential dinner companions at Wagon Wheel Acres, but the idea of getting involved with any of them felt distasteful. Engaging with them would have felt like condoning my wife's affair with Robert. I couldn't accept their relationship, yet I felt trapped, unable to find a way out while still maintaining my dignity. But considering my current predicament, I decided to indulge myself for the evening and focus on finding a solution later. I left home a bit earlier than usual, wanting to give my Toyota a run through the car wash. It wasn't particularly dirty, but this evening felt special. Sure, it would have been nice to arrive in a more impressive vehicle, but I had to work with what I had. As I sat in the Sheridan parking lot, I found myself torn between not wanting to arrive too early and not wanting to keep my escort waiting. I cursed my lack of experience in these matters, feeling like a nervous teenager. When she finally emerged, I knew I'd made the right choice. She exuded class, her dress impeccably tailored without a hint of vulgarity. There was no mistaking her for anything other than a refined lady. At fifty-eight, she looked stunning. And for a fleeting moment, I entertained the idea of going all in. But reality soon set in. Talk was cheap, and I knew I wasn't cut out for anything beyond dinner. That was my limit for the night. With careful precision, I pulled up to the entrance and hurried around to open the door for her. Peterson, I presume. Yes, indeed. And how should I address you? Richard Peterson. Just Richard will do. She sported a mischievous smile as she caught my reaction. Her smile lingered as I circled back to the driver's seat. I don't quite understand. I thought you were arranging an escort for me. That was the plan. But I had a chat with Kenneth. Afterward, I decided I was the best choice for tonight. Is this a regular thing for you? She chuckled softly. No, not at all. In fact, it's been six years since I've been out with a gentleman. Did I come across as that desperate? No, not at all. But Kenneth mentioned you could use a little pick-me-up. And truth be told, I haven't had a nice evening out in ages. Now enough business. Can I have the lobster? Richard opted for a small fillet instead of the lobster. The evening unfolded just as I had envisioned. After dinner, we engaged in hours of conversation until the waitstaff discreetly hinted it was time to leave. She revealed she'd never been married and had entered the escort business during college. Over time, she'd risen to run her own operation, evidently proud of her accomplishments. As I began driving towards the Sheridan to drop her off, she provided a local address instead. It turned out to be a small brick house 
nestled in an exclusive neighborhood. The peculiar part was the for sale sign in the yard, standing out among the grand residences nearby. Walking her to the front door, I pondered my next move. Should I expect an invitation inside? Maybe a kiss goodbye? Or perhaps a simple handshake would suffice? She promptly resolved the dilemma with one of her charming smiles. I hope your evening was everything you hoped for, Peterson, she said, extending her hand. I nodded, reaching for my wallet. That'll be three hundred dollars, please, she added. I hadn't anticipated this, but I should have. Now, I found myself smiling as I peeled off three bills from the wad of hundreds I had brought along. We were together for almost four hours, I pointed out. Yes, but that was my choice, not yours. I'll only charge you for the first hour. Is that all right? She explained. Of course, it was worth twice that. I replied sincerely. I observed as she folded the bills and slipped them into her bra with a deliberate motion, as if straight out of a movie. It seemed intentional, perhaps to catch me off guard. It seemed intentional, perhaps to catch me off guard. Richard, can we do this again? She inquired. Are you sure? I sensed a hint of seriousness in her tone, which intrigued me. Absolutely. I had a wonderful evening. I'd do this every night if I could afford it, I admitted. She chuckled. Why don't you come over tomorrow night around six? I'll cook us something. I'd love to, I agreed, pausing before asking. How much will that set me back? Three hundred dollars, silly. It's always three hundred dollars, she replied with a smile. At that moment, she took my arm and leaned in for a kiss, catching me off guard and heightening the excitement of the unexpected gesture. The following morning at breakfast presented my opportunity. I found myself observing Pamela and Robert from across the dining room when Kenneth pulled up a chair, inserting himself into our table group. Although he'd already eaten, he still held on to a cup of coffee. Peterson, my friend, how was your evening? Kenneth's inquiry left the others at the table puzzled. Better than expected, I replied with a smile. Way better than expected. Setting my plate aside, I grabbed my coffee and we made our way to the coffee urn. Is that all you're going to tell me? Kenneth pressed, his curiosity evident. Kenneth, there's not much more to say. We had dinner, and that was it. Nothing beyond that. I didn't engage in anything more, I explained. Well then, what the hell did you pay her for? Kenneth's bluntness caught me off guard, leaving me momentarily speechless. Unable to provide a satisfactory response, I remained silent as we settled into the lounge area with fresh cups of coffee. Kenneth, could you do me a favor and procure some pills for me? I asked, changing the subject. Sure thing. Barbara can hook you up at $20 a pop. Her annuity dried up a few years ago, but she manages to stay here by selling them. Ah, the wonders of free enterprise, I remarked dryly. So, Peterson, who did she set you up with? I feel like I know all of them by now, Kenneth inquired, steering the conversation back to the previous night's events. It was clear from Kenneth's tone that he hadn't experienced an evening with Richard himself. I trusted her when she mentioned not having had a client in six years. In fact, I found myself believing nearly everything she had told me. Whether she was genuinely honest or an adept liar, the ability to deceive convincingly was undoubtedly an asset in her profession. I think her name was Karen. She had a Slavic or Russian accent, I offered, choosing not to disclose the truth for some reason. As we continued chatting, Pamela and Robert strolled past, absorbed in their private world. My wife didn't spare me a glance or acknowledge my presence. No one would have guessed we were married. I heard Kenneth chuckle under his breath, earning him a playful jab in the ribs. Dinner with Richard was another memorable evening. While she wasn't a gourmet chef, she certainly knew her way around the kitchen. Kenneth had called earlier, insisting on being set up with Karen. Richard quickly caught on and arranged for him to meet one of her new recruits, an aspiring actress eager to showcase her Dr. Zhivago accent to poor Kenneth. I sensed that Richard appreciated my discretion in not revealing Karen's name to Kenneth. 
The evening ended all too soon, and as I bid her farewell, I received another kiss, accompanied by another $300. The following evening, we opted for sushi. While I knew what I liked to order, she effortlessly conversed with the waiter in Japanese, showcasing yet another impressive skill. She truly was an extraordinary woman, and I found myself yearning to spend every available moment with her. However, the reality of my marriage and the recurring $300 fee loomed over me like a dark cloud. Despite our extended time together, the costs remained consistent, leaving me perplexed and reluctant to inquire further. Things reached a breaking point that weekend when my daughter, Mary, paid a visit. Although she lived just an hour away, she only made the trip three or four times a year. This visit seemed different from previous ones. Upon her arrival, Mary bypassed our room, now solely mine, and headed straight for the room occupied by Robert and her mother. They spent over two hours together, followed by an additional hour strolling the grounds, chatting, and laughing. Eventually, I observed Mary checking her watch and exchanging words with her mother before departing towards the main complex building. I didn't feel inclined to engage in conversation with her at that moment, so I slipped out the back of the building. Moments later, I watched as her car exited the parking lot, returning her to her seemingly contented home. I felt a pang of sadness, realizing that my relationship with Mary might not be as strong as I had believed. Meanwhile, Pamela and Robert remained seated by the koi pond, lost in each other's company. That night, I found solace with Richard. I appreciated her patience in allowing me to initiate intimacy, and I was overjoyed by her enthusiastic response. I also made sure to compensate Barbara with a hundred bucks. However, my elation was short-lived as I received some unwelcome news. Richard had made some significant changes in her life. Not only had she sold her house, but she had also offloaded her business to a group of the more seasoned young women who had pooled their resources to buy her out. Surprisingly, her college degree turned out to be an MBA, equipping her with the financial savvy to maneuver investments for optimal returns. As a result, she wasn't just well-off, she was downright wealthy. For the past year, she had been overseeing the extensive refurbishment of a house she had purchased in Merida, Mexico. Now that the renovations were complete, she was ready to make the move. By now, I knew her well enough to understand that she wouldn't approach the subject herself. Despite my uncertainty about the future, I knew I had to ask. Richard, is there any chance I could join you? Her response came not in words, but in a warm smile and an embrace. This woman had encountered countless men, yet somehow I had become the one she chose to stay with. Flattered yet bewildered, I decided against probing her motives and instead chose to embrace them. Peterson, I believe we can make this work. If you're willing, she offered. I suppose I'll need to get a divorce, I ventured. Absolutely not. You'd risk losing half of everything you have. Let me handle everything for you. We'll be leaving in ten days. Are you certain about this? She inquired. Oh, yes, absolutely. I affirmed. By the way, where exactly is Marita? The following week was a whirlwind of activity. Thankfully, my passport was up to date. Richard arranged for a document allowing me to sell my unit at Wagon Wheel Acres back to the management. While it wasn't a substantial sum, I did manage to recoup 80% of the original purchase price. Richard took care of all the logistics for our move to Merida. She opened a Citibank account for me, which operated as Banamex in Merida. She assured me that I'd have enough funds to live comfortably, especially since I wouldn't have rent or utility expenses. The proceeds from selling my apartment went into this account, followed by the funds from my checking and savings accounts. My retirement package from Russell Industries included an annuity account designed to safeguard my assets. Fortunately, Richard had connections willing to purchase the annuity for a fixed sum. Remembering those commercials where people shouted, It's my money and I want it now. I was skeptical, but I ended up receiving 82% of the account's value. While I forfeited monthly payments, I received a substantial cash payout, depositing nearly $800,000 into my Citibank account. Selling my Toyota was a breeze, 
providing me with extra cash for incidental expenses. By then, Richard had set up an account for me at Banamex in Merida, allowing me to transfer funds from Citibank whenever needed. I also arranged for my social security check to be deposited automatically, a process that required a trip to the local social security office. A bit of a hassle, but worth it for peace of mind. In the final days before our departure, I spent all my time at Richard's place. Kenneth informed me that Pamela hadn't even noticed my absence. Of course not. I gave Kenneth my HGTV as a parting gift. With my departure, payments to Wagon Wheel Acres ceased, meaning no more financial support for Pamela. From now on, Robert Nelson would be footing the bill for his lover. Describing the houses in Merida is a challenge. It feels more akin to a quaint village in Spain or Italy. The homes boast pastel hues tightly clustered together, appearing simple and unadorned from the outside, yet boasting elaborate interiors. Richard and I swiftly settled into our new abode, with her shouldering all expenses. I attempted to offset this by showering her with small gifts, until she firmly insisted I desist. Everything felt harmonious, until one day, six months later, Mary appeared. Richard graciously welcomed my daughter into her home before excusing herself to run errands. I found myself alone with my child, though I had no inclination to converse. Dad, what are you doing here? You have to come home, Mary declared, her frustration evident. I struggled to find a response to her blunt opening. Gesturing for her to take a seat, I asked, Can you be more specific? Mary appeared even more exasperated. You left without a word, taking everything with you. Yeah. So what? I replied nonchalantly. What about mom? She pressed. What about her? I invited her to join me, but she chose to stay with Robert. I lied, fully aware of the falsehood. Mary had no way to verify my claim. But you took everything, our savings, your retirement account. What was she supposed to do? Mary persisted. She seemed content without me. In fact, she wanted nothing to do with me. Why are you here now? I countered. You can't just abandon her. She's your wife. Mary admonished. The last time you visited Wagon Wheel Acres before I left, you spent three hours with Robert and Mom, but none with me. Why? Mary's accusatory tone sliced through the air. I tried to find you, but you weren't in your room, I replied defensively. After three hours, was I just an afterthought? Some obligation, she retorted sharply. Don't be dramatic. Mom was happy with Robert. She wanted me to get to know him, I explained, attempting to defuse the tension. Fine, let him take care of her. Did you know she was sleeping in his room with him? Mary's voice crackled with frustration. Yes, she claimed you no longer wanted to share a bed with her, I admitted reluctantly. Did you actually believe that? She demanded. What do you want? Mary, why did you bother to find me and come here? I'm not going back. I won't allow her to flaunt her infidelity in my face. It was humiliating and degrading. And if you can't see that, you need help, I countered, my voice tinged with bitterness. John and I can't afford her fees at Wagon Wheel Acres anymore. Her social security doesn't cover half the expenses, and they won't let her stay without full payment. Mary explained, her voice softening. What about Robert? Wasn't he supposed to help out? I questioned. Robert Nelson was moved to the Alzheimer's wing three months ago. Mom can't stay in the same room, and we can't afford a separate unit. Mary revealed, her tone heavy with resignation. So, you want me to give her money so she can stay close to her lover? I demanded incredulously. Dad, she's comfortable there. She wants to stay because it's safe and familiar, Mary pleaded. Bullshit, she wants to be near him, even if he no longer knows who she is. I won't let her use me for this, I declared firmly. You're not being fair, Mary protested. Why don't you let her live with you? Your house is big enough, I suggested. We offered, but she refused. She wants to stay at Wagon Wheel Acres, Mary admitted, sounding defeated. I rose from my chair and headed to the front hallway. Retrieving my hat from the peg by the door, I glanced at Mary. 
She had traveled over a thousand miles for nothing. Her mother had betrayed me. And now my daughter was trying to guilt trip me for not accepting the humiliation. I'm going to the market. Close the door on your way out, I said tersely, knowing exactly where I could find Richard. As I walked away, I realized I would never understand what drove Pamela to act as she did. But I didn't care anymore. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.